their own uh, what we call uh, uh, New Year. So the New Year is very, very special. And so may this New Year be very special. And I have different people from different nationalities sending greetings to me uh, because of my relationship with different ones. So even though they are not uh, Chinese, you know, they're Indian, they're Caucasian. And so that's how it is. We, we send greetings one to another for the new year. And, uh, and I'm sure it pleases the Lord that we uh, lean in to celebrate the, uh, the new year of every culture. All right, Every culture have uh, the chance to restart whatever has gone before, the good uh, will propel us further, the bad will instruct us, make us stronger, and uh, and we wish uh, well to everyone, right? We want to do good to everyone all the, all the at all times. That's a very good rule and resolution for every new year, to make sure that uh, we uh, restart the engines that have gone cold, or we... Uh, what do you call retune <laughs> even the same engine right so that it runs better okay so uh, let's go to today's uh, i'm kind of excited uh, looking forward to what we are embarking on because i was thinking i'm gonna do um, just what do you call one lesson right but uh, during the course of this past week um, the Lord made it clear that I'm to uh, meditate on the life of Joseph. All right. Okay. Now you see my my computer is stuck, just flipping the pages. Okay. But uh, it pleases the Lord, and I'm very clear about it. You know, all these years when I'm preparing these lessons. I, I try not to have too much of an agenda myself out of my own personal interest, although that would be lovely. But I try to I try to be sensitive to how the Lord leads. And uh, so I'm looking forward to studying uh, Joseph the Dreamer as popularly known with all of us. Uh, but really, we are linking it to the parable, the twin parable of the parable of the treasure hidden, found, and then hidden again, and then field owned. And then the pearl of great price, so these two. But here's a scripture, Malachi 3.17, that is very special to every one of us. When speaking of the new covenant to come, where God will come and we find the Levitical priesthood into a true priesthood after the order of Melchizedek, which you and I are part of. That means to be kings, not just to be priests of on the land, right? So the Melchizedek priesthood brings the new added grandeur of the glory of God in his chosen family. And here's what God says. They shall be mine, says Yahweh of hosts, in the day when I make up my cellular, that's another powerful word, my treasure possession, I will spare them as a man spares the son who serves him. Are you and I the son, the daughter who serves the living God? That's a big question because there are many sons and daughters in a family, but which of the sons and daughters really serve? The father, the family. So be very, very attentive to how the Bible instructs us again and again. Uh, it's not just being in the family, but being the family. Very sadly, generations of believers in the New Covenant and generations of those in the family of God in the Old Covenant, they were born into the family of God in the Old Covenant, uh, they are not quite family. And as we come to Joseph, we will realize that the majority of that family is not quite family, right? And, and we are going to be reminded uh, how we need to be family, real family. All right. So, so um, we, we see that Joseph 
is betrayed by the majority of his family, own family, by the way, own blood, own flesh and blood, and is stripped of everything, thrown into a pit, and sold as a houseless slave in Egypt. Basically, he is being buried, literally. So as you think of uh, through the Old Testament, this is the most prominent story. The other one is Elijah thrown into a cistern of mud, right? So we, we, we see this, but in Joseph, we see this being done by his own brothers. But we also see how God's kingdom purpose will prevail. And that's why it's so important to understand and believe and flow in God's kingdom purpose, no matter the circumstances, no matter the darkness, no matter the resistance, no, ma no matter the frustrations, no matter the disappointments, believe that God's kingdom purpose will prevail in the son who serves him. Now, Joseph, as the companion parable or the twin parable to the parable of the hidden treasure in Matthew 13 reveals, Joseph is pull of great price and so it's through this particular facet of this diamond right we are going to look and we're going to see the multi colored coat the multi colored uh, rope facets of this pearl of great price so we will track Joseph you know all the way of from his home and then to the abandoned valley of Shechem to the treasured fields of Goshen. So his long journey, discovering how the life journey of a disciple of Christ and you and I as disciples of Christ, we are that spiritual pearl of great price. And this journey must of necessity, and we should underline that of necessity, be fraught with all kinds of disappointments, dangers, and obstacles. Now, some Christians say, well, I have it good, I have it easy from day one to day end. Yeah, because they did not take that journey as a disciple like Joseph, like Paul, like Daniel, right? So there's a difference. They did not push their service to the point where it cuts both ways it cuts the enemies and it cuts the ones who are family who become enemies and of course it cuts the same disciple it's going to happen because of the disciples own limitations and failures and disappointments and also the failures and disappointments of the community even the family around that disciple. So in the last meditation, we had learned the 16 aspects of the Matthew, specifically Matthew phrase, kingdom of the heavens. So much like the facets of the diamond. And so, um, so make sure that you and I are familiar with that because we're going to stand before the Lord. And one of the most important thing that the Lord is going to measure us by is you have had 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years to read the Bible. Have you figured out even what the kingdom of the heavens really is? Do you know all the places where it was being used and why? So that's the reason why we go into detail uh, week after week, exploring the scriptures, because we are sons of God who are kings and priests. All right, so let's read these twin parables in Matthew 13 once again. Matthew 13, 44 and to 46. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy goes and sells all he has and buys that field again. The kingdom of the heavens it's like a merchant looking for fine pearls when he found one of great value. He went and sold everything he had and bought it. So you see this uh, twin parables uh, really emphasizing that same point 
of dispossessing everything in order to possess that one thing. And in the case of the man, the whole field. And we find that in the Joseph story, I've never thought about this connection until I begin to prepare for uh, this teaching this parable to see the Joseph story in these two parables. All right, so that it's also kind of amazed me that oh, so many years and then I never made that direct connection. But Joseph is a dreamer. He's out in the fields and he's looking for his brothers in the field. And later on, he, he controls all the fields, uh, produce of Egypt. And later on, he, he was able to visualize and plan and purpose and teach his brothers and his family to come and possess the fields of Goshen. That's powerful. All right. And then the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant, not just a man who bought the field in order to possess that treasure that he he found and then he buried again and then he <laughs> go and buy the field in order to possess it. But it's like a merchant. Now, Joseph was being merchandised, right? He he was sold by his brother. He was being merchandised. He became a property, a chattel. He became the possession, right, of other people. He was being merchandised, but yet he became the most powerful merchant in all of Egypt. And he was only next in, 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 in the position to the pharaoh. He was a vizier, you call him that. You, or you can say he's a prime minister, right, of Egypt, but he is really the treasurer and the mercantile uh, uh, treasurer. So he was able to bring in all these excess uh, land, uh, produce, the grain of the seven years of plenty, and then merchandise, sell them to different uh, people in need all across the land, even people outside of the land even his own family twice that's a powerful merchant all right so uh, let's first read today we are going to look at part one act one all right this is all the i'm not sure how many uh, lessons we will go through joseph um the joseph story is it works like this from genesis 37 basically until 50 it's the Joseph story. Now, the first 11 chapters of the Bible is what we call the primeval history. And then from chapter uh, 12, uh, you know, down to uh, 20 something, you know, you have maybe 20, uh, 25, you have the Abraham story, focus on Abraham. And then after that, 26 on to 36, we have the Jacob story. Very, very focused. These are our patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they are important to us because we are part of that spiritual bloodline. All right, so we're going to uh, learn more about Joseph in the, uh, the following few meditations revolve around him being that pearl of great price and being that treasure that was hid in the field and that was eventually possessed. But we're going to read the first 11 verses, which we will um, exposit today. Jacob dwelt in the land of his father's sojournings in Canaan. This is the lineage of Jacob, Joseph, 17 years old, was pasturing the flock with his brothers. He was a lad with the sons of Bilhar and Zilpah, his father's wives, and Joseph uh, brought, sorry, ill report of them to their father. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he was the son of his old age and he made him a robe of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak 
peacefully to him. Now, Joseph dreamt a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, here, please, this dream that I've dreamt. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheaves arose and stood upright, and behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. His brothers said to him, Are you indeed to reign over us, or are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamt another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I have dreamt another dream. Behold, the sun, the moon, the eleven stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamt? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. All right, so let's go to the first section. We will discover what's wrong with Joseph. Four things that I've identified here. All right, what's wrong with Joseph? All right, let's go to verse 1. Genesis 37, verse 1. Jacob dwelt in the land of his father's sojournings in Canaan. Now, that's a very important introduction. Why? Because it introduces a family who are travelers, who are temporary residents, right? And spiritually, as we are that generation of Jacob through Jesus Christ, the son of another Joseph, right? We are all on a spiritual journey. Like Peter says, we are just pilgrims, strangers in this world, right? So, so we have to understand and we are in Canaan, in the promised land, in the promised covenant, in the everlasting covenant. We are not like just everyone else in the world when we are in the sojourning family. And our journey is the journey through life in the light because we are citizens of heaven. So our journey is journeying through darkness, bringing that light and and drawing more light and giving more light. That's our journey. So, you know, our Christian journey will fraught with all kinds of darkness and all kinds of, you know, uh, what do you call it? pressures and good and evil, all kinds of temptations. But that's our journey. And we would be hurt by it, but we would also be instructed by it. And uh, we would make losses, but we would also make gains and gains never to, uh, that could not be lost. That's our journey. And verse 2 tells us this is the lineage or generations. This is in the plural, the tolidot. That's a very important word. And in our meditation, at least for today, I'll, I will put many of the Hebrew words. These are very, very powerful concepts and for those of you and some of you uh, you 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 really need this and you tell me and and that's why I'm preparing for you because you will go and pay attention to these words and track them tolidot is a very technical word that speaks about generations and you find that you have a tolidot of Abraham and and so forth all these patriarchs they have the tolid these are the generations of who these are the generations of who so but we belong to that generation of Jacob. We are the generations that have come out of Jacob spiritually, out of not just the 12 tribes, but out of the 1,200 tribes and of the 12,000 tribes of the nations of the world. We are that family. We are that heritage. And we have an inheritance. So that word also speaks of an inheritance, not just a generation, but also an inheritance. Now, Joseph, the first problem, as we see in um, uh, the, the first thing is that he was youthful and inexperienced, right? So Joseph, who was 17 years old, 
was pasturing the flock with his brothers. His brothers were much older, presumably, at least in that, you know, some of them even pushing past perhaps 30. <laughs> That's pretty old by those standards, Reuben being the oldest. And then Joseph uh, uh, was born to Rachel. And um, so he was 17 now. And what happened? He was now learning to be a shepherd, but he was not quite with the rest of the these older brothers because he was youthful to them. And how do we know? He was a lad, Na'ar, with the sons of Bilhar and Zilpah, his father's wives, or his father's, you can say, you know, uh, maid, handmaiden, maidservant wives, given, as we know, because of wanting uh, to have to possess Jacob. So, so each of the, the sisters would offer their mates to uh, Jacob because they need some offspring. They, they, they wanted uh, heritage. So anyway, he was an R. Uh, now, um, if you have translations that says he was a boy, okay, because it's from Na'ar. But here in this sense, the Na'ar also means an assistant, an understudy, all right? So specifically here, he was an assistant shepherd, you can say, with the sons of Bilhar and Zilpah. And Joseph brought Iliport. I, I missed out the word uh, when I was doing something. Joseph brought an ill report of them to their father. That word is very important. It's called ra'ah diba. So the second problem with him was he was frank, but frankly naive. All right, he was very frank, and frankly naive. Now I know that uh, perhaps you have heard through some teaching in the past, anywhere, everywhere. It's popular to cast. Uh, Joseph as just a flighty dreamer, not substantive, you know, very shallow and uh, and just very full of himself, right? So that could be the impression. But as we journey more and more into uh, the real world and studying the real life of this real person, Joseph, we realize uh, even through subsequently all his different challenges, he didn't show to be someone uh, to uh, to just say anything, all right, bad about people just for the sake. He would tell it like it is later on in his twin, in in the dreams, kind of twin by the baker and the butler. And one he gives an ill report, once he gives a good report. He says it like it is, right? He tell it like it is. That's powerful to tell it like it is but it cuts, it hurts individuals who don't like it told as it is. But that's it is. But that is a very particular uh, characteristic of a true prophet. You tell it like it is. And most of the time, the prophets of the Old Testament and even the New Testament sometimes, but most of the time the Old Testament, the prophets, when they speak, it's just like they are taking uh, a knife and just slicing off, you know, parts of the skin, the dead skin of, you know, of the people of Israel, right? So it's very painful in doing surgery, very painful. There's that. But then because of that, he's being buried. He's being buried by his brothers, the brothers they buried him for his youthfulness and inexperience. They bury him for his frank and naive. They, they want him to just go and die, just go into the ground and be forgotten. Now, verse 3 tells us how he's being favored upon, favored and doted upon. Verse 3, now Israel loved Joseph. Now, very interesting, we move from Jacob to Israel. All right. So note that in verse one and verse two, we're talking about Jacob. And now verse three, suddenly we use the other name of Jacob, which is Israel. All right. Israel was given when Jacob wrestled that night with the angel of the Lord 
and he was given this name, Israel, Prince of God, a leader who would stand up. So now we, when we see this change in the text, sudden change, we know that it's not just a man who's a father, who's Jacob, it's a man who is a destiny himself, who is Israel, who is a prince of God, and he's now standing in that capacity in the covenant call of God that was very specific to his own life. And he loved Joseph, Ahava, so the usual word for love, Joseph more than any of his sons. Now, does that speak of partiality, of being unfair because you put favor? And we have the word because, key in the Hebrew, and, and you know why I want to put that Hebrew word there. Key, because he was the son of his old age. Okay, all right, we get it. Uh, finally, Rachel has a son, finally, after many years, and it was Joseph, right? And, and, but of course, uh, uh, then what about Benjamin later on? And how old was Benjamin? So we have some technical issues here, but we'll leave that aside. And he made him a robe of many colors. Wow, a robe of many colors. And I will uh, show us how, um, you know, this robe of many colors shows up in exactly one other place. Okay, let's go down here. In 2 Samuel 13, Ammon, who is half-brother to a lot of David's children, including to Tamar, came to a place where he felt that he needed to possess, uh, to possess this sister, you know, bodily, sexually. And so his, his good friend, or you can say his bad friend, uh, helped him to hatch a plan uh, and to say that he's sick and then he needed attention. And then so the word got to King David who then sent the sister to go and take care of his brother, Amnon, and then to cook for him. And Amnon says, uh, come in, uh, you know, feed me with your hand. And he sent all the rest of the people out of his room. And then he forced himself upon her. And after forcing himself upon her, uh, we are told that immediately he hated Sane, uh, uh, this sister, Tamar, with such a great hatred that it was greater than the love which he had even loved her before. So love and hate, sometimes it can work like this. The love and hate uh, that is not really founded truly in the love of God works like this. You can love a person to death and you can hate them to death. That means that that love is really more of an emotional, uh, when I feel happy, when you give me my needs, I love you. When I, when I don't, when, when you don't give my needs, then I might even hate you. And so the degrees of that. But, but true love is that is founded in, in God does not quite work in that way, right? Uh, there is a hatred of God, but it's not expressed in this uh, foul and violent way, all right? So, and so Amnon just couldn't stand this sister anymore, this lover. She was willing to be married to him. She was very wise and prudent. So from the little that we know of her, uh, she is very wise and prudent, and she probably would be a, a great beauty because Absalom is probably the most handsome of and the most brilliant of all the sons of David. Uh, he is the he she is the, the the full sibling to Absalom. Okay, so anyway. Verse 18 of 2 Samuel 13. Now, she was wearing a robe of many colors, ketone pasim. For thus were the virgin, the Bethula, daughters of the king dressed. So his servant put her out and bolted the door after her, and Tamar put ashes on her head and tore the robe of many colors. Sorry, it should be many, not meant. <laughs> ketone uh, pasim that she wore and she laid her hand on her head and went away crying aloud as she went and her brother Absalom said to her has Amnon your brother been with you now hold your peace my sister he's your brother 
do not take this to heart. So Tamar lived a desolate woman in her brother Absalom's house. So you can say she had to live the shame and the pain, uh, desolation, even though she was dressed in a robe of many colors. Now that's a great honor. Uh, that is a recognition uh, of her nobility. And uh, she has come to that place of special mention, but yet she was brought down to be shamed, right? So that coat of many colors, uh, scholars have, have also looked at it as an on, heavily ornamented cloak. So it can also mean that a heavily, heavily ornamented and ornate cloak, but it shows the dignity and the prestige and the favor. And so she is rightfully uh, a leader in her own right. She is a real princess, and uh, and so she's dressed in that robe, special robe, the katuni. All right, so let's move back uh, to this. So you see here Joseph and Tamar. Very interestingly, Genesis 38, the narrative breaks from the Joseph narrative to a Judah narrative, and in there, there's another Tamar. Another Tamar was a foreigner and who finally got a son out of Judah himself because Judah's older sons, the first and second, were killed because they were, they, they were not uh, in God's will. They did what is evil in God's eyes. And then the third son, Sheila, was not given to Tamar. And so Tamar was smart and brilliant. And she sold herself, you can say, get everything that she had. So called way late, the father-in-law, as he was going to attend to a business, uh, like a roadside harlot. And uh, a Judah conceived a baby uh, through Tamar. So Tamar and Joseph, they speak of those who are very specially favored. They are placed in a place of honor. And so, Russ, so that's why uh, something is different about him, right? So now earlier on, we also look at how they brought an ill report. Now, the only other place where you see an ill report being brought is the men who Moses sent out to spy the land in Numbers 14 and 36, we are told that when they returned, they made all the congregation grumble against Moses by bringing, and against God, of course, bringing up a ra'ah diba, a bad report about the land. So is this bad report really that bad? As I have uh, reasoned earlier on, uh, if the bad report was really true, all right, then it is an honest report. But even if it's an honest report, but is accompanied by bad faith, by an unbelief, a lack of faith in the God who already promised them that they are going to possess the land, then it becomes a bad report that God will see to it, right? So, so we have to think in totes in many colors, shades. So we cannot just swing to one side and say, oh, because uh, those spies who brought back that, the, the 10 spies who brought back the bad report uh, and then accept Joshua and Caleb who resisted that. Therefore, Joseph must be doing a bad thing. I think that's a, a false, what we call, uh, a net false uh, parallel. Right, but we have to see it in its different tones and colors. In this case, uh, it was a bad report that was being honest because, as we find out, Joseph is very honest and upfront with everyone. Everyone can, even when the father put his hands uh, crosswise to bless the the younger son with a greater blessing. And Joseph said, "Dad, you got it wrong," and he he wanted to set it right. That's who Joseph is. Now, but it, 
if you are being favored upon, you're being frank and, and naive and you, and perceived to be useful in experience, you tend to be despised. You tend to be despised, all right? And hated even, because here we see when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. So they sane, they're fuming with anger and could not daba. The word daba is very, very important. It, it, it can refer to speak, speech, or words, or things. All right, so the 10 daba, the 10 commandments, are the 10 things that God spoke on that mountain in Sinai later on in this story. All right, so, and they could not speak shalom to him. They could not, they could not be at peace with him. They could not hold the family heritage together, that peace. So whenever we find that we, we are not able to accept or in peace and walk peacefully with anyone, you know, that is that condition here, right? So there are things going on. All right, we move on to uh, next section, verses 5 to uh, 8. And here we want to look at what did Joseph do wrong? Why did he end up where he ends up being, you know, banished from his brother's company and uh, and later on, we see he'll be thrown into the pit. Well, because his dreams are larger than life. And his companions couldn't curb or contain his excitement and enthusiasm. Right? When you are a dreamer, I have a dream, like Martin Luther King. Right? God has a dream. And who started dreaming? So we are told in verse 5, no, Joseph dreamt a dream. That's the word chalom, like a chesed. So C-H-A-L-O-M, chalom. So he had a chalom. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. So what can make a person hate you more in the family and even in the family of God when you have a dream that is larger than life? And when your companions could not see or catch your dream and your vision and all kinds of bells and whistles and all kinds of negativity could possibly be uh, birthed out of that. So, now, but who was the first dreamer in the Bible? Really, it was his father, Jacob, I think. I don't think of... Isaac dreaming and uh, Abraham dreaming. Well, maybe there was a tiny little bit dream given to uh, uh, the Elit Melek, you know, and so forth. But we see Jacob when he was on that journey, running away from his family home to his ancestral home because of have, having stolen the, his brother's. Esau's birthright's blessing. He fell into a dream as his head was upon a rock and a ladder was set up between earth and heaven and angels were ascending and descending on that ladder. All right. So Jacob brings us in this family and we, through Jacob, the generation of Jacob, through Jesus, belonging now to the house of Israel, we are on this journey of a dream. We see the dream of God. We see the dream and it's bigger. And, you know, uh, the, the problem is we cannot see the dream big enough. And later we see in verse 8, his brother said to him, are you indeed to Malak to reign over us? Or are you indeed to rule over us? To reign and to rule. To Malak is to suggest even to take up kingship and to, um, to rule, marshal, is to take authority, kingship and authority. The Christian church, generation after generation, have a real problem, even our generation, in believing the size of this vision. You know, I teach about us being kings and priests. 
but not many in the church really believe that. Because if we really believe that, we would be seriously learning the Bible, seriously going the second mile, seriously, uh, you know, making ourselves ready to stand before the Lord, to be crowned by Him, seriously knowing that every word of the law that we are attentive to, careful to, will become part of that rulings and judgments that we can rule out of and judge out from. But we don't see this dream big enough. So we bury our own vision, we we'll bury our own treasure, and we even help to bury the vision of that enthusiastic young lad, young preacher, or young evangelist, or the one who is older already, and yet that dream and that vision is too large for us. They really believed it. Because we look at the ordinary of life, and life is not like that. I'm not literally sitting on, on top of the world, literally sitting on a physical throne, so how can I be ruling and reigning? It's because we are thinking too small. Do you think the kings and the queens of the world are really ruling when they walk in evil, they walk in deceit, they walk in opulence, where beggars are sitting by their door steps, eating their scraps, when they only think of themselves, they're not ruling and judging as the kingdom of heaven. But you and I, we are disciples of Jesus. So do not shortchange yourself or others. Okay, so there are three problems here or, uh, that Jesus, Joseph did wrong, right? Verse 6, he said to his brothers, Shamar, here, Shamar, O Israel, the Lord your God is one God. That's the word, very powerful, Shamar or Shema. All right, so that's the word. See, here, and then the second word he say is Na. So Shama, Na. So Shama is here. Right, really listen in so that it becomes a part of you. And then pray, the word Na. Uh, he has the, the, the older English way of pray, it means quickly now. All right, so please, it's like almost begging. Nah, please, all right, pay attention. All right, right now, this dream that I've dreamt. But you see, the brothers have no ears, and so they could not hear, they would not hear what he's saying. You know, please, please do not fall into the deaf and dumb crowd company, right? So, because we are supposed to have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying. So don't be the wrong audience. When Jesus was speaking his parables, he told the disciples that, yeah, only to you, you will be able to give and to understand, hear and understand the mysteries of the kingdom of heavens, but not to them, the larger audience, no. They will, they will hear but not understand, see and not perceive, because God will not allow them their mind to change, to repent, to be instructed, because they, they will be judged. So, you see, if we don't really pay attention, if we don't really quickly pay attention, shamana, the dream that God has given to us. I have a dream. I have a people. I'm chosen, and they will be instructed by me and my spirit will be in them, my laws will be written in their hearts, and I will possess them as my people, and they will possess me as their God. That's a dream that is very large. Can you imagine if we are, I, I know, I think, is it, uh, who was the prince who put out a, a biography recently, and it sold many, many, many copies, right? I think millions of copies, <laughs> right? Uh, so, what about you and I? Do we have a story to tell? Do we have a story to tell? Do we have a princely, a real princely story to tell? And uh, sorry, I, I, I know Prince Charles, his younger brother, just momentarily uh, forgot his name. I'm so sorry. Uh, um, so, but anyway, some people were already attacking the biography, uh, saying, oh, this, 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 this. <laughs> okay, but there's a story to tell. You have a story to write. Heaven is writing a story about you. Okay, 
Um, second problem is the wrong content. Verse 7, Behold, Hine, we were binding sheaves in the field, and Hine, behold, my sheaves stood, arose and stood upright, and Hine, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down, like prostrate, shakha, to my sheep. Wow, this is certainly... Uh, verse 7, the first part is really the wrong content. Why? Because the audience didn't like the subject matter. Right? They could hear it immediately. What? You are promoting yourself. Your sheaf rose up. Not only arose, but it stood upright and way above us. And then all the other sheaves are gathered around to worship this sheaf, you. So... It's not only the wrong content, but the wrong balance of power. The power struggle in the family of God is real. Right? It's very real. Churches ends up in fights, resting for power, rest, resting for uh, positions. And even if you are not physically you know, uh, doing that, there's all kinds of fights for a balance of power. Who is right? Who is wrong? Who should be listened to? Who should not be? And we are, and hopefully we are not the participants of that struggle for power. You know, it's very sad. Uh, no one is immune from the highest parts of the leadership within the, the church, within Christian uh, ministry at large, uh, to the laymen in the pew. If we are not careful, we we are drawn into this um, balance of power struggle. You know, how should we posture ourselves? We should posture ourselves always by leaning into the will, the purpose of God. So understanding his will and his purpose, and we flow in it. And we don't need to struggle for recognition. We don't need to struggle for uh, power and authority. We don't need to struggle for that. That's how we, we are going to be truly great in the kingdom of God, because God is going to authorize us. It's going to empower us for eternity. So, but on the other hand, this, the, the wrestlings between this balance of power uh, often will end up bearing you, the one who is just saying it like it is, the one who is reporting it like it is, testifying to what the word of God says. So understand that this is one of the reasons. So we have identified the root causes of all these wrongs, seeming wrong, the wrong audience, the wrong content, the wrong balance of power, is that the brothers of Jacob said to him, are you indeed to reign over us? Almost like a king, right? Because the word suggests that. And, or are you indeed to rule over us? In other words, to, to have authority over us. So, and uh, we see there's unbelief towards another person, especially is what you mean you you mean you are promoted and I'm not. You know, you you may like myself have gone through many moments in this uh, in this journey of life. Yes, I have been challenged. I was uh, I I was honored several times in the army as being the top graduate <laughs> and and. Uh, once there was another officer who really challenged me and said, why should you get the top honor? You know? And so, I mean, and so, okay, we will do a test, see our ability. And so let's measure, let's, and I remember we did, uh, okay, let's do a distance test. So, and so we measure a hundred meters. So it's just a very simple and simplest of tests, but literally we walked out basing on pacing and I was right and he was wrong. All right, so so that was a simple statement. So he says, so what's so great about you being the honor graduate of this Rangers course? Well, uh, I'm not great. I'm I'm actually not the strongest, fastest, cleverest soldier, really. But I just believe the word of the commander, and I just do. I just believe, and I just do, and I make my failures. I fell asleep times. I I. Was, supposed to be punished and many times escape punishments because of special favor, all right? Uh, no, so, so your life can be like that, can be like a Joseph. Just believe, believe your real authority. But then 
be prepared. They hated Joseph even more for his dreams and for his words. All right? So uh, I have a quotation there from Romans 12, 3, for by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. God has assigned to Joseph a bigger vision because he could accommodate it. He could contain it. All right? His companions, his brothers could not contain that. Not only could they not contain or hold that dream, they tried to prevent Jacob from containing his... So they tried to prevent their brother Joseph from com containing that vision. All right, so there's a subtle uh, distinction between curbing and containing. The brothers could not contain that dream. J Joseph could contain that dream. But the brothers didn't want Joseph to contain that dream. So they tried to curb it, prevent Jacob from entering into that dream. But really that dream is a dream of God, from God. Okay, so we, we have this uh, here that uh, Joseph was just outflowing the grace of God given to him, right? He did not think of himself more highly, although it sounds like he was speaking of himself being placed as a king and as a lord over his brothers, but he's just reporting that. And look at how the youthfulness and the excitement, you see, yeah, oh, please. And then, hine, hine, hine. You can hear that. And they bow down. They literally fall flat down. That's an act of uh, what we call worship, right? So in the Greek also, proskenio is the same, you, you are prone down. That's an act of worship to him. Now, I want to comment on this verse 8 here because uh, we need to understand how to do proper Bible study one more way. Identify inferior, even bad translations. And here in 37 verse 8, I've... Uh, taken three popular Bibles, all right, um, that you can see uh, uh, each one grows in seriousness. This is contemporary English version written at a very primary elementary level, so any, anyone can read it. And so this is CEV. In fact, that was the first Bible that I had Shara read through it when she was in her uh, early teens, right? So uh, very easy to read. And then the New American Bible, some love it. So some love the New American Standard Bible. In fact, I used to have one, uh, and I, a very nice leather one. I gave it to uh, our missionary in uh, Ireland, right? Our missionary friend, uh, Tracy Hogan, and she loved it. Well, that's a good Bible because it's more literal, like, uh, uh, like the King James Bible. And then the Amplified Bible. This one is the one that almost every prophet that I know, or prophetic person uh, that I know, they love the Amplified Bible because it it expands every verse uh, in in ways that allow them to see it in more colors and tones and whatever, right? But you want to see the limitations and the problems with each of these translations, even with the Amplified Bible on this scripture. So here, the contemporary English version, the problem is overgeneralization. The New American Bible is... It's misleading. And then the Amplified Bible is over interpretation. Okay, let's go to the con contemporary English version. His brothers asked, do you really think you're going to be king and rule over us? Okay, that's a bit of uh, jumping the gun here to be king. Oh, but it, it's still suggested in the word malak. All right. So And so it's still okay all right, to, to exercise that kind of uh, kingly authority over us. Okay, still okay. And here's where the problem. Now, they hated Joseph more than ever because of what he had said about his dream. What's so problematic about because of what he had said about his dream? That's because it is not, in the Hebrew, it is not because of what he said about the dreams at all. The word is not because there, all right? The word there is L, 
which is the word for, not because. So the word Hebrew word is L, A -A L, you can say. It can mean on, about, of, at, or for. All right. So, but because and for, I know unless you are not just an English major, but you are proficient enough to, uh, to see that there are places where you cannot interchange because and for. So in the Hebrew language, there's a word because, which is called key. All right. Key is, let me just go up here uh, to show you in verse three, I think. All right. Genesis 37, verse 3. Now, jo Israel loved Joseph more than any of his sons, key, or because he was the son of his old age. So that's the word. So there was a because there, because Joseph was getting old and desperate that Rachel, his, his real true love of his life as a companion, could not have a son. And finally, all right, because he, he, he belongs to Rachel. I've got a bit of Rachel with me. In Joseph. Or oh, a lot of Rachel in Joseph. And so that's the because there. But here the word is not key, but Al. All right? Al, we have to uh, see it for that. And so it's for two reasons as we can see in, in here. So they hated him even more for his dreams, of his dreams, and for his words, for of, of his daba, all right? Of his halon, of his daba. So two separate concepts here. If Jacob had dreamt that he was bowing down and serving to all the other 12 sheaves, etc., or he's bowing down to all whatever the stars and or to the moon and whatever. If if Jacob's dream had the content had been different, right? But the content of his dream is for the content of that dream. So they they are not uh, having a problem with Jacob. Okay, you can dream, but please don't dream us into an imperial position, <laughs> all right? <laughs> it seems that way, right? So so when you use here because of what he had said about his dream, um, uh, you're only uh, giving. So it's not only that, because of his dream and because he is his word. So you're over generalization. Although a generalized meaning is there, you're over and you're destroying the two separate categories. Now, let's go to the New American Bible, the misleading. The brothers hated him all the more. Again, they used because of his dreams and his reports. So what's more, most problematic here? Of course, we have the because problem here, but also his reports, right? Because by saying his reports, you're thinking of Joseph brought the ill report of them and so forth and so forth, right? but it's really his words. So you can make uh, too quick of an association there. It's just for his words, all right? So it, it's not uh, negative reporting. Later on, you know, you'll see uh, Joseph being sent by Jacob to go and check on his brothers, whether they're doing the job well, shepherding, and to bring a report back, all right? So you may make the association with that. But it is not, all right? So it's become misleading. And then we look at the Amplified Bible. Here we see, here we see uh, his brothers said to him, are you actually going to reign over us? Okay, that's good. Are you going to rule and govern us? Now they added here, as your subjects. Now that's adding too much. As your subjects, as your kingdom subjects. That's too much, all right? So that's... Uh, assuming that they are going to have subjects. There are some who rule and reign and who don't have subjects, even in in uh, in real life, right? There are some who rule and reign in places of authority, but they don't have subjects. Okay, so, so, so that's saying way too much. Yeah. 
And so they hated him even more for telling his, for, and then here they, they added in the word at the amplifier, telling about his dreams. So this is a more serious error. So for telling about his dreams. But what if, what if he was telling dreams about something good that, that was favorable to the brothers, right? So, so, so he's saying a bit too much. And for his arrogant words, well, his words arrogant, so there's a value judgment here immediately. But, you know, these are things that we can very easily slip into, all of us, in many places throughout the Bible. We can slip into overgeneralization or misleading or overinterpretation. And so uh, we are learning how to catch all the nuances of the text as part of our journey. And so uh, these are very important if you are seriously going to think like Jesus, think like Daniel, think like Paul, right? So these are not things uh, that we want to set aside and say, oh, just a waste of time. And that's the problem. Our vision is not large enough. And we, because it is so large, we, we, it takes a long time to see all the details, but we want to see the details even if it's a tiny bit at one time, right? The, the hare raises a head because he wants to finish the race fast, but he says, I've got a lot of time, and he just rested and he fell asleep. Whereas the, the turtle, the tortoise, just goes bit by bit by bit by bit by bit by bit by bit, and he comes to the finish line before the rabbit and the hare. So better be the rabbit. So this is the year of the rabbit. <laughs> Okay, let's uh, move on. Okay, final panel. Here we see that Joseph never stops dreaming and his dream gets even bigger. That's why he needs to be buried by those who can't stand the size of that dream, right? So verse uh, 9 of chapter 37, Genesis, then he dreamt another dream. So dreamt another dream, dreamt a dream, dreamt a dream. This uh, these words are repeated over and over again. We are being drowned in dreams almost, right? But it's important. And he told his brother, and it needs to be told, Behold, I have dreamt another dream. Behold, the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars were bowing down to me. And when he told it to his father and to his brothers, right? So now we edit the phrase, he told his fathers as well, besides the the brothers, his father rebuked him, censured him as a good father will do, and said to him, now that's the immediate response of his father Jacob right now, right? He said, what is this dream that you have dreamt? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? Okay, our scholars have detected here a, a problem. Who is your mother? Uh, by this time, uh, Rachel is gone. And uh, because in chapter 35 of Genesis, so is this mother uh, Leah or is this mother uh, Bilhah, right? Uh, uh, the other and the other one. Are they any of these ones? So uh, and so you you cannot have a situation in which you have uh, 11 brothers or, 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 you know, all at once with the father and the mother, right? So there are various technical difficulties if you think about it. But you know what? The details of this narrative, which functions also like a parable, uh, may not be perfect through a Western Greek way of analyzing, all right? It's just like the parables of Jesus. There are loose ends. Because the main narrative of that parable, just like the main narrative here of this uh, journey, a pitch in the life of Jacob, all right, is telling a bigger story. And so when, when dreams and visions are introduced, it would introduce uh, it in a certain way that may not fit every tight little space in the house, all right? So that's okay. So here, uh, those of you who want to dream on and to explore uh, how you're going to make it work, shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground, uh, you can do so. All right, so I invite you to do so. But I wanted to point out here 
about this doubling of the dreams, just like this doubling of the parable of the hidden treasure and the pearl of great price. They are twin. Here in Joseph, we see the doubling of dreams. He himself, and later on, uh, you will see the in 41, the dreams of Pharaoh. But even before that, in chapter 40, you see the dream of the butler and the dream of the baker, right? A doubling of that dream, a doubling of that dream. But we are given a very interesting theological conclusion in chapter 41 when Pharaoh had the dreams. And so Joseph was brought before him and Joseph explained to him what the dreams were. The dreams of Pharaoh are one. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he's about to do. The seven good cows are seven years and the seven good ears of corn are seven years. The dreams are one. They speak to the same one reality. And in verse 32, the doubling of Pharaoh's dream means that the thing is fixed by God and God will shortly bring it to pass. So here we have the word from Joseph who is bringing the mind of God. So, um, you know, the doubling of dreams, or, and sometimes you can say the tripling. So when God has chosen certain individuals, all right, for a specific uh, prophetic work ministry or destiny, he may speak in visions or dreams that are in pairs, all right? So, um, so I've had multiple dreams, and some of them I can pair them together as well. And so I know that the Lord is speaking to that same issue. So, and in the parables of Jesus in Matthew 13, you know, uh, the pearl of great price and the hidden treasure, you have that pair. So it means that is real. There's treasure in the field, and perhaps lots of treasure in the field. You got to possess the whole field, and there's the, this is the pearl of great price. So God wants to possess us as that pearl of great price, and we want to possess Him as that kingdom field. All right, and possess every one of the treasures in that field, including for not just ourselves but others, brothers and sisters who are treasures in that field, hidden and buried. So that's what dri driving us because we believe that Jesus meant it. It is so. It is, it is fixed by God. It is something that will come to pass shortly. Your life and my life, all our lives appears for a while and disappears. We know that. Very short while. But the word of God endures forever, we are told. Right? And so... We live out the vision, the word of God, right? So, and then finally, verse 11, his brothers were jealous, Kana, of him, but his father kept that dabar, that saying, that thought, that thing, that matter in mind. And that reminds us of Luke 2, 49, after Jesus was found missing, his parents came back to look for him for three days. And when they found him, and Jesus said, why are you searching for me? Didn't you know that I had to be in my father's house or I had to be in my father's business? But they did not understand what he was saying. See, Jesus had a vision, had an understanding much bigger, had a dream much bigger, and they don't understand. But he went down to Nazareth with them, was obedient to them, but his mother, Mary, treasured all these things in our hearts. Right? So we see here Jacob or Israel kept these things in his heart. This is his favorite son, kept these things in his heart. We are told in Luke 2, 52, and Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. And that's what Joseph did. As well. But his brothers were Kana of him. And so Kana is one of those words that again cuts two ways. It's the word 
jealous as in J E A L O U S and the word zealous as in Z or Z E A L O U S. So it's it functions in both contexts. All right. So you can be jealous or burning with envy. That's the you can say the negative side of that jealousy. But you can be zealous kana with the glory of or giving glory to someone or to God or to a project, right? So, so be very careful because the same zealousness could also be jealousy. All right. But how about can we learn to use that same emotion, the raw emotions, and turn it uh, into that kana which does not hurt people but give glory to people because you give glory first to God and that's what we can do so may the Lord uh, continue to bring us uh, deeper and richer into uh, the this journey uh, as that buried treasure that feel to be possessed as that pearl of great price now and always Amen. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance before you and grant to you that dream, that dream of Joseph, that dream of dreams of Jesus, that you may continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ truly as kings and priests, now and always. Amen.